Underwriting for Auto Line this week is provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on Auto Line this week. We're going to be talking about the cars that drove America because we've got this beautiful picture book out called Driving America. In fact, at the end of the show, I'll tell you how you could end up being the owner of one of these books. It's all coming out of the Henry Ford Museum, and joining me today are three experts in that regard because, first off, we've got Patricia Meradian, the president of the Henry Ford, Bob Casey, the former transportation curator at the museum, now retired, and Matt Anderson, the current transportation curator. And great to have all of you here on the set of AutoLine. Thanks. We're great delighted to be, to be here. Thank you. For those who may not know, Patricia, fill them in. It, you know, we used to call it the Henry Ford Museum. Now it's called the Henry Ford. Why is that and what is it? Right. Well, the campus is the Henry Ford, as you know, and it's a large 250-acre campus. It's also a, a, a National Historic Landmark destination, but we have five public venues right on campus there, which is Henry Ford Museum, Greenfield Village, which is our outdoor. We have uh, IMAX Theater. We run and the, the Ford Rouge Factory Tour. And we also have the Benson Ford Research Center right on the campus. So, And of course, this is something that Henry Ford himself started. It was his own personal collection of artifacts. In 1929. But what's really interesting is he really believed in collecting artifacts that represented progress in America. Um, in order to learn from them. And so he started the institution as a school, a very large school, because not only did he collect artifacts, he collected buildings of historic significance. So they are all on our campus now today. We continue to collect. Um, we still have a school on our campus, but when Henry started it in 1929, it was K through 12, and the kids had access to all, their art, all the artifacts because he believed in hands-on learning. So the kids could put their hands on things and learn how we progressed in America. And now it's a high school? We have a high school on campus with 500 uh, students. It's a public charter high school. Um, so they go to school, right? It, the whole philosophy is public school and public space. Lucky kids. I wish I had been able to go it's there. Amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. But let's talk about this book. Uh, Bob, well, let me start with you. Matt, we'll get into it. Uh, you've written a book on the Model T. Now you've written a book on the cars in the museum. Not all of them, but you've picked out what you think are some of the best, I take it. We picked out the, the cars that are in our new automobile exhibit called Driving America, appropriately enough. Uh, that exhibit opened in January of 2012, and uh, as part of that effort, we did high-class photography of all those cars, and that gave us the resources then to put together, for the first time really, a really high-class book on the vehicles that you will see. Now, we still have a lot of vehicles in storage, but if you come to the Henry Ford Museum, you'll see those vehicles on the floor in the Driving America exhibit. Matt, what got the book going? I mean, what really kicked us off? Well, uh, part of it is, as Bob said, the Driving America exhibit and the photography that was done. But what we wanted to do with this book was not, not so much an exhibit catalog where you simply repeat the text that's on the labels in there. We wanted to give a fresh approach to these vehicles. So uh, my job was to go through and look at each one of them and write up a, a new caption with some interesting perspective about that vehicle, why it's significant and where it fits in, in the larger story of the automobile in American life. Bob, you mentioned high-quality photography. It really is. I mean, you didn't just go snap pictures of these things out on the floor. These must have been shot individually. Uh, they were shot individually. We, had, there, we actually set up a photography studio uh, in the back of the museum, rolled the cars in. In a couple of cases where the cars were too big to roll, we actually rolled the studio with a huge light box right. and, and set them up and took pictures, uh, not only the overall of the cars, but details of the car, sometimes inside. So if you want to know what it was like to be inside one of the presidential vehicles, you can see here with some of these photographs. What's, what's kind of neat when you come to the museum, um, you see the cars, but and, and as most museums, you can only go up so far. And so 
in front of um, uh, a good portion of the exhibit in 18 different locations, we have touch screens, 42 inch touch screens, and all the photography from the cars that are in front of you are also on these screens. So if you want to get up close and personal, you can go through and call up different images because we took so many. And you can literally have a 360 degree view all the way around of the inside of the JFK limousine or of a carriage. Um, you know, because it isn't just cars, it's also what led up to the vehicle, to the it, automobile. It must have taken forever to shoot all these photographs. There's so many cars in this book, and I'm sure there's a lot more photographs than actually ended up in the book. It was several months. Uh, <laughs> while, while we were building the exhibit... I thought you were going to say several days. No, no, no. Several it was, months. It, it, took, it took a few months. Yeah, uh, while we were building enough. the exhibit in sort of the front of the museum, in the back of the museum, we were running the cars through. Um, and uh, preparing them and getting them cleaned up and all ready to take the photographs. When there was demand for this, this was something that people had wanted. Um, we only had the ability because of the exhibits and, and cars being on exhibit, they're so hard to move. Um, we, we only had photographs from their, the, the, the place on the exhibit floor. So when, when we decided we were going to redo this exhibition and do the new Driving America exhibition, we said, this is our opportunity. And um, it, was, it was quite a production, but it was, it was kind of exciting Well, to you watch. think this is hard. Thank goodness you didn't do one on locomotives or airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> of which the museum has we more than a few. Too. That's yes, right. We do definitely have those. Matt, are these all the cars in the Driving America exhibit, or, or did you have to pick and choose what went in there? These are, are the cars that are in the Driving America exhibit. As it turns out, there are 100 of them. Uh, there are a few exceptions. We decided not to put in commercial vehicles. So, for example, we have a semi truck in the back of the museum. That is not in here. We did decide to include the presidential limousines, though, even though they're sort of an exhibit unto themselves on the museum floor. But I think they have a natural home in that book. And that's what I love about the book. Is even though it's from the Henry Ford, and a lot of people might think, oh, it's all about old Fords. It's not. You've oh, got all oh. different kinds of brands in here. Absolutely. And even Henry Ford himself, when he was collecting these vehicles, he made a point of not only collecting Fords. I mean, he certainly collected some important vehicles from his past, like the quadricycle, but he got early Chevrolets. He got a lot of early marks that are long vanished. So uh, that's a longstanding tradition at the museum. Yeah. And there's something very significant of, of, uh, about each vehicle and why they were selected to be in the exhibit and why they were selected to be in the collection. They have a historical meaning uh, that Absolutely. goes beyond just it being an old car. In other words. Yes. And, and we'll get into uh, some of that. Bob, what I love about the book is it's not, you don't start with the oldest car and end up with the newest one. You sprinkled and mixed all different kinds of pictures and types of cars throughout the book. The book is organized actually alphabetically. So if you uh, want to know what Chevrolets we have, why well, you can go to the Chevrolet section. Mm -hmm. um, but the one result of that is, as you say, it's not chronological. They, uh, the age varies. And then we've got a lot of cars that are uh, what today we would call orphans. Uh, they're no longer made. Uh, white steamers and uh, uh, the Scripps booth uh, uh, Rocket, uh, one of the so-called cycle cars, and Crosley Hotshot, and just all manner of things. A Rambler limousine. Uh, who today think of Rambler as having ever made a limousine? Well, in the early days, they did. I hadn't picked up on that, that it's uh, chrono or alphabetical, it's not alphabetical. chronological. Yeah, it's but, alphabetical, yeah. But the, the net result is, every time you turn the page, there's another surprise there. It's not like, oh, I'm going to another car from the brass era, for example. Mm -hmm. It could be anything that's in there. Mm -hmm. right. and, and Matt, you've, you've got cars that were not necessarily cars that ended up in showrooms. You've got concept cars and one-offs and racing cars. This is true. A lot of people are surprised at the sort of cars we collect. Uh, probably the best-known concept car, we have Mustang One, which is not not to be confused with the Mustang that we all know and love from 1964. This is an uh, earlier racing car that was built as sort of a prototype concept, so that's in the collection. We have a lot of everyday cars people are surprised to see in there, like a, a Ford Taurus, for example. I mean, no one might think of that as museum-worthy, quote-unquote, but in fact it is a very significant vehicle and had a huge influence on the way automobiles are still designed even today. In fact, you've got the first Honda Accord made in America, and you've got a first-generation Toyota Prius, too. Absolutely. The Prius is one of the most recent vehicles in the collection, and uh, you know, needless to say, that's been very influential. And that's a car that's a great example of people purchasing a car not necessarily because of, of what it is, but because of what it says about them and their own beliefs. In, in this case, it's you know, a belief in conservation and caring for the environment. 
Bob, you were the curator of transportation at the Henry Ford for, what, 20 years 20 or something years, like yeah. that. You collected a, a number of these a, cars. A number of them, yes. What, what drives your thinking where you go, okay, that one has to go in the museum? What we try to do with that collection is um, represent the whole sweep of automotive history in America. And, and uh, try to select vehicles that allow us to uh, delineate various trends, styling, engineering, marketing. Um, and one result is that you end up often with cars that the average person would not think of as collectible. So we have a Duesenberg. We don't have five. We have one uh, because a Duesenberg is an enormously significant car. Uh, but we've got a car like the Prius. We've got what turned out to be the hardest car to find uh, for this exhibit and shows up in the book was a 1978 Dodge Omni. <laughs> now, you would say, why do you want a Dodge Omni, first of all? Well, because it was really um, one of the first responses to the whole changing dynamic of fuel supplies and prices and all. It was an American application of what had become a European architecture of front-wheel drive, transverse engine. And we wanted the 78 because that was the first year. Turns out that's a classic example of a car that gets used up and thrown away. And we had a heck of a time. We finally found, believe it or not, there's an Omni Horizon collector in Ohio. And he had this Omni. and. He reluctantly sold it to us, but he decided it was a chance for it to be in a museum. Um, and it's also an example of, uh, it, it, it proves that rarity and monetary value do not necessarily go hand in hand. <laughs> Thank goodness for the, the budget Thank at the museum, cost. right? Yeah. <laughs> How interesting that a 1978 Dodge Omni is now something hard to find. Very hard. I would have never known that because yeah. hundreds of thousands of them are made. Yep. How interesting. One of my favorites in the book and in the museum are the, the belly tank racers. Matt, Matt, why don't you run the audience through that a little bit yeah, if you're not yeah. familiar with Those it. Those are fantastic vehicles. They come out of Southern California. They are land speed record cars where you're just trying to drive as fast as you can. And they're literally built from uh, belly fuel tanks from uh, World War II fighter planes. You know, to increase the range on the planes, they built these external tanks. And the idea was that you'd use up all that fuel on your way into the mission, then you'd just drop the tank and you'd have enough to get home. Well, those tanks, of course, are aerodynamically shaped, so they're just the right size. You can cram an engine in there, uh, stick a driver in there, not necessarily comfortably, but get him in there, and then stick four wheels out there, and they're just perfect for uh, achieving land speed records. And we've got one of those in the collection. And it, it's truly an American phenomena, the, the belly tank racers. And, and I gotta believe that's why it's called Driving America, right? These are American cars. Mm -hmm. You might have a Prius in there, or a Honda Accord and whatnot, but the, the Honda was manufactured in, mm -hmm. in the U.S. and of course the, the Prius was sold here. You don't have any vehicles that didn't affect the American that's market. Right. Exactly. And another great example is the Volkswagen Beetle that we have in the collection. And obviously that's a German car, but an incredibly important car and influential in the American market. It, it very much, in fact, it probably could have sold more of them here than anywhere else in the world, as a matter of fact. Um, and racing plays uh, mm -hmm. a role in all this, too. Bob, uh, you know, why, what's the importance of racing cars in your view that you included them in the book? Um, we, we really, well, auto racing is one of those things, sports that's popular in, in virtually every country where, there's, where automobiles are widely available. Um, I, you get two people together uh, with two vehicles or even just two people and their feet. And um, one of them wants to say, I can beat you to that tree. Uh, and so auto racing uh, has been part of the American automobile scene uh, virtually from the, from the beginning. The first automobile race in America was 1895. So we've tried to collect vehicles that represent, the, again, the sweep of American auto racing, different types, stock car racing, uh, sports cars, drag racing, land speed racing. And we've tried to collect cars that were, uh, were winners. Uh, and, and we already had a number of those cars. Uh, when I got here, we had the 1965 Indianapolis winner, the, the Lotus Ford. We had the 67 Le Mans winner. Um, uh, we had uh, uh, Henry Ford's uh, uh, 999. Uh, we had some, some really significant cars. 
And we've tried to build on that. The first American winner of the Vanderbilt Cup, uh, a uh, 56 Chrysler uh, stock car from NASCAR, uh, which will scare you as how stock it really was. <laughs> um, but uh, the man who ran that team, a guy named Carl Kiekefer, in many ways is the prototype for the modern NASCAR owner. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've always looked, the, the Belly Tank Lakester was one that, that uh, came back to Bonneville for a dozen years and virtually every year it set a new record in its class. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to find vehicles that were, were winners that represent sort of the best of a particular genre. Patricia, my understanding is you're going to add a uh, display area, including race cars, as part of uh, the Driving America exhibit. So right now the, the race cars are on exhibit in Driving America, but we have a concept already in the, um, in the works right now to create a whole exhibition and really a visitor experience that's a deep dive into uh, American racing. Uh, using our vehicles and using other other experiential type things as well. We've been collecting artifacts, collecting uh, documentation of racing in America, and we look forward to being able to put that together. We're raising funds for that right now. Oh, okay, so if anyone in the audience wants to donate money to the museum, what do they do? Welcome that. Go to thehenryford.org or call me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Matt, what I love too about the book is you've got some of the most recent things, like we've talked about, Honda Accord, uh, uh, Toyota Prius, and some of the oldest. In fact, one, I had to write this down, an 1865 Roper steam carriage. And I'm blown away that there was something even resembling an automobile running around just one year after the Civil War ended. Absolutely. I, I love that car because it's only a car because now we know that's what to call it. You know, at the time when it came around, it, that concept simply didn't exist. And this was designed... It really is sort of a sideshow attraction, if you will. You'd pay money, you'd go and sit in the grandstands and watch somebody drive this miraculous vehicle under its own power. But mm -hmm. so far as we know, that is the earliest and surviving American automobile. So absolutely a treasure to have in the museum. And, and that's a key thing, o o oldest surviving. Yeah. There were probably other steam vehicles running around at the time, and I think even earlier ones in England, if, if you go back. So the, the whole concept of the automobile had been around for quite a time. It, it had been, absolutely. This idea of, of sort of getting away from the horse with a vehicle that can move itself had been around for a long time, and uh, you know the railroads sort of proved the practicality of steam power, but then they operated on railroad tracks, so it was only a matter of time before people started experimenting with vehicles yeah. that would operate outside of those tracks. So yes, there are a lot of predecessors to the car. And then at, at the extreme end of that, you've got the winner of the X Prize, which was a prize to see who in the United States could come up with a very efficient car. Why did you collect that one? It, it's a great car, and it, it, Bob talks about that in his essay. It's one of those cars, too, that, you know, as a museum curator, you sort of take a chance on that. You know, this car is significant, but will it be significant several years down the road, or will it just be an example of sort of a one-off experiment? And, uh, you know, I think that, that took a lot of uh, courage on his part to collect that, and I think that's great. I think it's a fantastic piece, and it does belong in the museum. And one of the things about how we collect, um, we look at things... And Henry Ford did this too, so it, it's been sort of a trend for our, our institution anyway. Look at things that represent innovation in America. And some innovations fail and may not, you know, progress much past what, what you see in front of you in the museum. But others um, create legacies or they, be, they form the foundation for or a springboard for the next um, innovation. And so uh, we always say that our... Our, our museum, while it's American history and transportation is a big part of that American hist history, it's also about ideas and innovations that change the world. Mm -hmm. And so to the X Prize winner, you know, we'll see. But it, it's certainly an innovation. Yeah, it was, fr from an engineering standpoint, it's fascinating the way they went about solving this problem uh, using very light weight and aerodynamics and a very efficient engine. And it, it, the car actually holds four people. It's, it's quite astonishing. How much of that, uh, those features, are going to be translated into future cars, we don't really know. But I think as a, as a general rule, uh, going forward, car makers are going to have to make their cars lighter. Uh, they're already making them more aerodynamic. That's been going on for a long time. But that was a case where we thought, you know, this is a car that's really sort of pushing the boundaries. And it's conceivable that 20 years down the road, you may look back and say, well, it was a dead end. I, I don't think that's going to happen, but it's possible. 
On the other hand, things, things can come back on you. One of the cars that Henry Ford collected was a 1916 Woods Dual Power. Dual Power, it's a gas electric hybrid. In 1960. In 1960. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were an electric car maker and they were trying to stay alive and rather than going whole hog into gasoline powered cars, they made a hybrid and it didn't work very well and it died. And Henry was, I think, fascinated by the engineering of it, so he collected it. For a long time, it just looked like a dead end. Well, it's not a dead end anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. That's and, exactly that, right. and that part of the collecting philosophy is to collect things of today. And, so, and Henry was doing that then. So a lot of the cars that we have in our collection that he collected, maybe back then people were saying, why is he collecting that old thing? It didn't go anywhere. But in fact, he had a lot of vision and foresight because you learn from the past to influence your future. Yeah, and, and this from a guy who supposedly said that, you know, history was essentially bunk. You know, goes out and creates his own, one of the greatest museums in the world. Yeah. In the world. And, and Matt, Presidential limousines uh, factor heavily into this as well. I explain the reasoning behind that. Yes, we, we've got uh, four of them in the collection that are all featured in the book. We have uh, Franklin Roosevelt's Sunshine Special, which is sort of the first limousine custom built for a president. We have the uh, bubble top used by Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy. This is a Lincoln stretch limousine with a transparent bubble top. We have the uh, 61 Continental in which President Kennedy was, was riding when he was assassinated in 1963. Surprisingly, that car was completely rebuilt and put back into service for another So some people may plus. not even recognize it if they try to compare it, it's a picture. True. It's the, true. The, the car today looks that, a little that's different. Great. It looks very different. The first change, of course, was putting a permanent roof on that, and then it's right. got bulletproof glass all around. And, and then we've got a uh, Lincoln Continental that President Reagan is most associated with. It's the car he was getting into when he was shot in 1981. But of course, he survived from that. Jeez, and doesn't the museum have the chair that Lincoln was shot in as well. What, what is with all this presidential assassination it's, collection? It's surprising. Entirely coincidental, though. The, the presidential Lincolns are interesting because at, at that time, the White House leased the cars from Lincoln Motor Company. So when the lease was up or when the cars simply got too old and out of date, uh, they came back to Lincoln, and, and Lincoln really didn't need the cars, so they donated them to us. So that's mm -hmm. the reason we have so many of them today. I, I'm glad you do, actually. It, it's kind of a morbid subject, but it's definitely historical. Absolutely. Bob, you mentioned some of the the, the one-offs that you've got, like the, the X Prize, the Mustang One. Uh, the Mustang One, I kind of understand that's Ford. There's a great tie between the Ford Motor Company and the Henry Ford. But what about some of these others? It's got to be hard to go out and find these things, I would imagine. Um, it is. Uh, sometimes uh, they come to you. Uh, we have one of the Chrysler turbine cars from the early 60s. Um, Chrysler ended up destroying most of those cars, but they wanted homes for, for several of them, so they gave them to a number of museums. And, and again, it represents one of those not-quites <laughs> in automotive history. Uh, the turbine looked really, uh, really promising for a number of years, and then, for a whole variety of reasons, it turned out not to be the, the future. It's a future that never arrived. Um, and, and in some cases, we've got cars that are, are one-offs just because they um, are so old. Um, our little Scripps Booth uh, rocket, there's a, there's a wonderful car called a Durier Trap. Mm -hmm. um, Charles and Frank Durier started the first real automobile company in America. And we have one of their cars, too. The, the only surviving car from that production. But then the brothers split. And they each went their own way, and Charles was a fairly idiosyncratic guy. And one of the cars he made was a little three-wheeler. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderfully graceful car. Um, kind of a dead end. Uh, but um, uh, Henry Ford acquired it. And as far as we know, uh, there, uh, there may be one other Duryea trap surviving in the world. Wow. Uh, so... Um, you end up, sometimes it's serendipity, sometimes you uh, actually go after uh, the, the car that was the first American winner of the Vanderbilt Cup in 1908. That was a car that we went after, um, and uh, it was a one-off. Uh, two of them were built for the race, and one survives. Um, and um, it had been unrestored uh, throughout its whole life, and we were fortunate enough to be able to acquire it. Is it good to be a museum going after a car? 
Or is it bad in the sense that collectors go, aha, now we're going to make some money? You often keep your identity a secret. You don't, you don't tell them that it's <laughs> your museum because there's a, an assumption that somehow we're rolling in bucks. We're not. We're not. <laughs> <laughs> we're a nonprofit. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, what I should do is uh, put the book back up again and, and let the audience know we'll give away one of these copies. And what we'd like you to do is, if you'd like to win this book, go to uh, the Outline website. That's www.outoline.tv. We'll have a little icon there that says Driving America Book. Click that on and you'll have to fill out some information so we know how to get in touch with you. And then we'll pull out a name at random. And and this book is, uh, it, it, it's available out now for sale, is it? And it's what, uh, did I get this right? It's about $94? Is that right? $96? What's the price? It's, a, it's 95, 95 I think. Yeah. 95 I'll call it $100. Call so it 100 it's, yeah, uh, it's and, and believe me, for anybody who's into cars, into the cars that especially drove America, it's a, a fantastic collection of, of photos and uh, information about these cars. And I, I, can I add that we also have some collector items um, that have uh, books, special edition that have signatures from Jay Leno and Edsel Ford um, and us. Um, but those are collectible items as well. So very good to know. Special. And we should talk about the photographer because well, without without we're, we're down to the very end. Very end. So make it real his quick. His name is Mark Harmer, and he did a terrific job. And if you want a great picture of your collector car, he would be a guy to go to. Okay. Did a great job. I'm glad you got that plug in. Uh, <laughs> Patricia Meradian, thanks so much for coming Thank on. You. Bob Have Casey, nice. great to see you again. I've worked with you over the years, and now I'm going to be working with your... Uh, the next Bob Casey, as it were, Matt Anderson. Matt, great to have you here. In fact, great to have you all on Auto Line. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Underwriting for Auto Line this week is provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? the hybrid game MPG Challenge.